All right. And in the um, inimitable words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Right. Hello. So I'd like to welcome Peter Marx, Mark Wallace. Jose Murillo here. Gilson, Marx here. Okay. Don't go, don't go. You're, gonna, you're the ones who are going to understand this panel. So, um, my name is Joshua Fouts. Uh, at, uh, let's see, Ben's supposed to be up here too, isn't he? Oh, okay. okay. You're going to kibitz from the peanut gallery? <laughs> okay, okay, great. Okay, let's do the sound test. Do it. Okay, so we're going to do... What's that? Yes, of course. Explain to the people that are leaving what, what they're missing. <laughs> right. So those of you who are leaving, we're about to get a demonstration of a virtual world, uh, which is a, you can actually see our virtual panelists who are sitting here, who are not sitting here, but are sitting in uh, remote locations throughout the world. And um, they're actually going to be participating from Brazil, uh, also from the United States. So come on back. Um, is the sound, how are we on the sound check? Is that good? No? So I'm going to introduce myself uh, for starters. My name is Joshua Fouts. I, uh, I direct the Center on Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California. Uh, I want to thank Ben for, we lost Ben. Thank Ben for, well, oh, there you are. Great, good. Uh, for the opportunity of being here. Um, I should say that uh, Ben is a senior fellow at the Center on Public Diplomacy. We're honored to have him as a part of that. And I came to Ben about uh, four months ago with, uh, sounds like our audio is working. I came to Ben about four months ago with, as the uh, dean of the Annenberg School, Ernie Wilson uh, often describes me, with my hair on fire. I said, Ben, Ben, you've got to check out these virtual worlds. They're really changing what our, uh, what our society is. Do you want me to, how are we doing on the audio, Tori? Are we okay? Because I'm hearing feedback. Quite good. So, um, uh, and I, in fact, let me do a little bit of housekeeping since they're, te they're testing the audio. I'd say that, that um, much of these kinds of uh, uh, panels, which are, are conf technologically confusing uh, in general, uh, are, um, as we like to describe it, technology, <coughs> bless you, technology willing. And um, I would say, say, like to say thanks to Tori Horton and uh, Jorge Mora Fernandez, both from the University of Southern California, who, make, who made this a technological possibility, as well as our virtual uh, support team, the uh, Metaverse Utility Company, who you won't see, but you may see some of their avatars uh, in the front. And then we actually have a special um, support person, uh, Ms. Uh, Muriel Garcia, from, uh, here from Mexico City, who's actually part of a really unique program called Global Kids. Global Kids is an after-school program based out of New York City, in which they bring together kids from around the world via the virtual world of Second Life to meet each other, and, and in fact, building, building virtual bridges. Um, the, uh, so what is public diplomacy? What is public diplomacy? I don't know how many of you know what public diplomacy is. I'll give you a quick definition. The most conventional definition of public diplomacy in its purest form is what a government does to reach out to a foreign public or polity to explain its cultures, values, beliefs, what have you. Um, I like to think, and we like to think at the Center on Public Diplomacy, that this is no longer the domain of government, but it's now being condu conducted by civil societies, by NGOs. Um, it's really we, the people, who are serving as uh, conduits to build bridges between each other. And what does this have to do with virtual worlds? Well, virtual worlds actually are, a, a we think, a, 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 a place in which this kind of dialogue is taking place. The pa title of this panel, as you'll see from your program, is from the global to the local, hats off to, to the local people, virtual worlds, migration, and linguistic diaspora. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, but what we're really talking about here is how virtual worlds transcend or collapse geopolitical boundaries. Um, by that we mean in the virtual world of Second Life, which is but one of many, and you'll, you'll learn about virtual worlds from our panelists in a bit, um, there are over nine million registered users. Of those registered users in the virtual world of Second Life, where you have 3D avatars. I keep looking back because the, the getting people to sort of understand visually what it means to uh, occupy these spaces is, can be a bit of a leap. Nine, of the 9 million registered users, only 20% are from the United States. 
So what that means is in these virtual worlds, you actually have a disproportionate number of people from different countries. And I think that's part of what makes it exciting. I think that's part of what provides an opportunity for cultural dialogue. And I also believe that the rate at which technology is evolving, uh, a certain generation uh, is actually ha growing up immersed in, in this technology, will have a greater facility for it, and thus uh, it behooves us uh, to, to pay attention to how technology is changing the way that people are meeting each other. Um, this is part of, I should say, a year-long uh, grant that we received in June from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Uh, they asked us to try to have a conversation in virtual worlds, not just Second Life, but many of them throughout the, the coming year. And the conversation was to provide a counterpoint to how the U.S. media in particular is looking at these things. And I like to describe that there, there's a dichotomy in how the U.S. media looks at uh, virtual worlds. They either trivialize them or demonize them. And that is to say, by trivializing, they talk about how you can get rich in these spaces. Or they demonize them by talking about how it's corrupting our society, those sorts of things. So, uh, and, and the purpose of the grant is really to explore what good can come out of these spaces. If we have 9 million registered users in Second Life, we have, we have 16 million people playing World of Warcraft, which is another virtual space, and we have ten, tens and twenties of millions of people playing in virtual worlds in, in Asia that, we haven't, that don't even factor into, this, into the U.S. conversation, I think it really illustrates a different kind of interdependency. Okay, with that, I want to I get to our panelists because that's where some, the most excitement, I think, is going to take place here. So I'm really excited that uh, at least two of our panelists are here. Our third panelist actually was, uh, was tripped up not by technology but by policy. Uh, he was unable to get a, a visa from Brazil to Mexico. I don't know if anyone from the Mexican Foreign Ministry is here, but something should be done about that if the, the U.S. citizens don't have to get a, a visa. Um, so our first person, I'm gonna, we're sort of, sort of going to go from meta to micro, if we can, is Peter Marks. Peter Marks, uh, to my left here, is uh, the former chief technology officer of, officer of Vivendi Universal Games. And if any of you are familiar with that, what that means, it means that he was the, he was the chief technologist for the second or first largest video game design company in the world. Uh, originally based out of France, also with a significant presence in the United States. It is uh, the, the kind of games that Peter's been uh, a part of developing, including uh, NCAA College Hoops. Um, he worked at EA. I'm actually not going to go into the detail because I think that, uh, that you, can, you can read that in, in the biography, but I'm going to step away and let Peter tell us about what virtual worlds kind of mean. Can everybody hear me? Oh, yes, I can. So, my name is Peter Marks. Let me find our PowerPoint. Um, and we will find it. It's too bad because I work with a company which some of us have heard of by the name of MTV. Let me actually turn off this mic. Um, so, I'm essentially the Chief Technology Officer for MTV handling all of the We're talking about two issues, right? We've got to go to the world. So I handle, I handle technology for MTV networks with regards to video games, uh, virtual networks, virtual worlds, and social online networks. And then we'll talk about the part of technology, what we can do. Né? Onde que a gente vai botar, já começar a botar as coisas lá. Tá bom. Tá bom. O senhor te passa hoje ainda. Combinado. Um abração. Alô? Oi. Deixa eu só ficar com o telefone teu mais de emergência. Ok. 91. E o teu fixo aí tudo bem, é o que eu liguei, tranquilo. Combinado. Dia 25, tá na agenda. Beleza. Um abração.
personally gonna go back there and set myself, get virtual, and go hang out in Laguna Beach. Look at my decked out avatar. I think I'm looking pretty hot. I'm in the prom room, and I'm at prom, and there are so many people. It's crazy. The best part about the Virtual Hills is that if people are fans of the show, they can sign on and kind of live it virtually. I did the hey hey a lot. Next time I go into the Virtual Hills, I'll be talking about like a big event or a big party that's going on. It feels like it's real, like you're kicking it with all these people. Virtualhills.mtv.com tonight at 8 p.m. These guys will be appearing, so check that out. So it's quite a different type of entertainment. I'm not sure if everybody caught the differences between, you know, in the virtual world where you saw avatars which are graphical representations, such as the one behind me. It looks nothing like me. But you know, if you remember the old New Yorker cartoon, on the internet nobody knows if you're a dog. Well, here you can be a dog, yet still be a, anybody you want it to be. And the great thing about virtual worlds is that because it is such a, a leveler socially, people can interact regardless of their location in the world, regardless of their language, and regardless of the cultural, religious, political, and all the other differentiators, it essentially allows you to uh, do, as a lot of people do in California, to reinvent yourself. Um, and what we find so interesting is, is that my former company, which was Vivendi Universal, we shipped a product called uh, World of Warcraft. And World of Warcraft was launched in two countries simultaneously. It was launched in South Korea, and it was launched in, in the United States. And we, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly right now, there are a little bit north of 9 million active people. People who get onto the internet, they're playing in a, in a uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Say that five times backwards. And they're interacting with each other under the context of a completely fantastical world, which has, bears no resemblance to reality, yet they, you know, I've obviously found some use for it because the average amount of consumption on a weekly basis is 20 hours, which is a part-time job. So with that, I'll end, and uh, I'll turn it over to Mark. That's it. Great. So uh, thanks so much, Peter. The next, our next panelist, um, I've, I've, I consider myself lucky because basically I got to invite um, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm uh, a self-avowed fan of all the speakers today, so um, uh, our next panelist is Mark Wallace. Um, Mark is uh, a, a bit of a celebrity, you might not have heard of him, uh, but he's incredibly well known in the virtual world world because he's one of the first and few journalists who are actually reporting on what's going on in virtual worlds. And uh, so Mark is actually launching a new top secret company that we don't, we can't know about. Other, we don't know what it's going to be doing, but we know that it's going to be called Wello World, um, which is sort of is a spin on Hello World. But more importantly, Mark has written for the New York Times, the London Times, uh, and he was the launch of Second Life's most read news publication, first and most read, I guess, called uh, Second, The Second Life Herald. And he's coming out with a book uh, called The Second Life Herald, the virtual tabloid that witnessed the dawn of the metaverse. Mark Wallace. Thanks, Josh. Um, <clears throat> I have to say at the outset that I'm the co-author of that book, and not, uh, and, and nor am I the founder of the Herald. It's something that I latched onto uh, after it was uh, uh, going. So I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm. I may be uh, breaking ground here, but not entirely. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about uh, virtual worlds, um, not so much as, as places necessarily, but as as channels, as as. Uh, tools of communication, uh, and that's not always the most intuitive way uh, to think of them because we see um, a picture of, of uh, Second Life here and you saw Virtual Laguna Beach um, 
in the video, and, and uh, they look very much like places, and they're touted as places, and these are, uh, you know, World of Warcraft is, is this, this kind of uh, uh, internally consistent world unto itself, and, and uh, they're very compelling as places, um, but I think that it, it uh, uh, thinking about them that way misses a lot of the, the power that's inherent in the uh, communications that go on there and why there's a, a kind of a new sort of thing uh, happening in virtual worlds that has not been happening uh, before on the internet, I think. Um, and you have to think of how much information you can transmit uh, via a given channel, right? So um, before we had all these uh, electronic communications, we were writing letters, which, which you can get a lot of information into, uh, but it's, a not, it's not a very immediate uh, mode of communication, right? It takes a long time to, to get your message across. Um, and at this point, uh, on the internet, we've got all kinds of different things you can do. You can send instant messages, uh, which are very immediate, but, but are, uh, have a very uh, small bandwidth, right? You can't get a lot into, uh, into a single message. You can, actually do, you, you can actually do a lot of different things in there. It's not as thin uh, a channel as it sounds like, as, as a lot of you, I'm sure, know. Um, we've evolved ways to communicate uh, via instant message. Um, but it's still pretty narrow compared to some other uh, bands that we have access to. Um, and you, you, you know, I don't know exactly what the hierarchy is, but you can step up to email, which uh, more resembles a written letter, uh, but is m much more immediate. Uh, you can go to voice, like a telephone or, uh, or um, uh, you know, voice over the internet. Um, and you can do vid video conferencing, which gives you access usually to not only uh, the voice communications, but things like uh, facial expressions and sometimes gestures and things like that. Um, and it's important to remember that those are all part of how we communicate, right? We, and and we, we forget uh, about some of those things when we think about online communications because it's mostly, uh, until recently, taken the shape of instant message and email, and you don't have access to things like tone of voice and gesture and things like that. Um, uh, and what we have more recently, uh, only in the past 10 years or so, or, or less than that, is access to these 3D virtual spaces uh, in which uh, people can communicate in a, in a, in a different way. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to work because I'm not uh, driving my avatar there, but um, Peter is in Texas, a uh, different Peter. Um, and if I could just ask him to have uh, Walker Spade as the name of my avatar. Um, just to have Walker turn around for a moment and maybe uh, step away from the podium. So it's kind of, it, it says something to, if I were to just, you know, walk over here and start talking to you from, from here, or just turn my back on the room, right? It's a gesture that, that conveys something to you guys in the room, uh, but it's the kind of gesture that we haven't really had access to online uh, until, the, until the advent of these virtual worlds. Um, and you've found, uh, as soon as you get people in the same space online, even in the text-based virtual worlds that, that um, preceded these kind of graphical-based virtual worlds, uh, you would see people using them not to play the games that were embedded in them, but, but simply to communicate. There, um, there's a couple of great stories about uh, a, an administrator of a, a text-based game um, noticing at, at like three in the morning that there were uh, like 30 people logged on, which was a lot for that game at that time. Um, and uh, so she went to see, and they were all in the same place, and she went to see what they were doing. And uh, this was a game that took place in a fantasy world of knights and dragons. And uh, they, they had all gathered in this room, and they were trading uh, recipes for oatmeal cookies. Um, <laughs> so they had completely left the, the kind of headline function of this place behind, and we're using it simply to communicate. Um, there's also a group of players in a, in a game called EverQuest, which is a graphical game uh, that, that uh, preceded World of Warcraft, um, uh, who, uh, uh, you know, and, you, who, and the, the, the progression of your character in these places is expressed in terms of levels. So you start at level one and you level up to level 50 or 60 or 70. Uh, so there's a group of players in EverQuest who I think are still active who have been in uh, this game for probably, you know, five or six or seven years, and they're all still, like, level three and level four, 
Uh, and they use the game a lot, but they don't play it. They, they log on to keep in touch with each other and to communicate. Um, so it's very interesting to see these places uh, used that way because it turns out that you know they're much more than just a game or a fantasy space or a place where you can kind of uh, dress up as, as anything you want. Um, they're, they're actually a, a fairly powerful medium for transmitting information uh, and there's a lot of immediacy to them and they're, they're very good at connecting people over distance. Um, and um, we just heard uh, a little bit about how much, uh, how much people use uh, social networks in these places and, and uh, it turns out that when you talk to young people that their interactions in online spaces, not necessarily virtual worlds, but also social networks and places like that, uh, are just as important to them, they say, as are their offline interactions, which is also very interesting, I think. Um, so there's a lot of information that we can transmit to each other uh, via virtual worlds, and there are a lot of the same things that, that shape our, our everyday interactions. Um, so I think that this is especially important as these places start to uh, become more and more prominent in, in society. And, and we're just beginning to see this happen now with things like Second Life and uh, Virtual Laguna Beach. Um, and we, uh, we actually write a lot about this at, at the Second Life Herald, <clears throat> that the way these places are governed uh, going forward is going to be very important because if you think of them as is tools of communication, and if you think of the internet as and not as this static thing, but as this very quickly, uh, very rapidly evolving uh, communications medium, um, I think we're going to see these 3D spaces or these multi multi user spaces uh, become more and more uh, prominent in the way that we run our everyday lives. Right? Most of you probably made arrangements to come to this conference uh, on the internet, or you may have heard of it for the first time on the internet, and you. You probably, uh, you know, did your background reading on the internet. Um, and we'll do more and more of these things in spaces like this. Um, and that will, <clears throat> at some point, extend itself into, you know, how we do things like civics and how we talk about uh, things like interdependence. Um, and the reason I think that is, is, uh, is merely because there are more powerful means of online communication than we than we've had, and why not utilize them that way, right? When we have these kind of tools, they inevit inevitably uh, get brought into the fold of how we do business. Um, so one thing to notice about what's happening right now, I think, is that um, virtual worlds are still, to a certain extent, these, these kind of walled gardens, and what happens uh, in them is not uh, very well reflected on the rest of the web or in the rest of your life, even though it's a, these are very real interactions. Um, but, but what's happening now is that they're just starting to become a little bit more integrated with the web and, and the broader internet, which we already use you know, very much for doing business. Um, I think that's a process that's going to accelerate um, going forward, and I think it's actually kind of important to foster that uh, if virtual worlds are to become uh, useful to us. Um, <clears throat> We also heard uh, a little bit about uh, how young people experience online interactions. Um, and one interesting thing to note is that uh, the people younger than uh, the demographic that Peter mentioned now come onto the internet and their first experience of online life is not a social network, but it's a multi-user graphical space. It's usually something like Club Penguin, right? Which you can get into for free when you're like, you know, eight years old or, or less, and you're, you're in this space where you're interacting with other people, you're playing games, you, you, are, you, know, you don't have access to quite the communication tools that you do in a place like Second Life because you can't just say anything. You have to choose from a, uh, a set of, of uh, preloaded phrases. But their first experience of online life is of the internet as a place where there are other people, right, that they can meet and talk to and become friends with. And it's very interesting to think about how this stuff is going to evolve uh, going forward when you have this generation of people growing up and that's how they think of, of the internet. You know, for most of us, uh, the internet wasn't around, right? The internet only dates from uh, 1993 or 1991. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it's something that we had to learn about and follow as it evolved. For these, for kids, it's something that's, you know, that they live and breathe with from 
the moment they have much agency in the world. Uh, so what they'll do with this medium is, is something that it's, it's hard for us to, to imagine uh, standing here. I think they'll, they'll be, um, they'll have much more to do with what the future of that medium looks like than we will, um, obviously. But it is important uh, for us, I think, to uh, make sure that, that these places are managed well, right? And that, that we do have the freedom to do what we need to do in them. Um, for, uh, for, a lot of, for a lot of you who probably are not very familiar with these places, I think that the most important thing that you can do is engage with them, right? And find out what's actually going on in there. Um, and programs like Josh's have a lot of great uh, information to share. Um, you can find out a lot of, uh, about what's going on uh, there by reading the Second Life Herald as well, but it has a little different take on things. Um, but you really need to experience these places to know what they're about. I can stand here and tell you that they're a very powerful communications medium and that you know kids are shaping the future and, and stuff like that. But until you, you get in there and actually compare your experience there to uh, your experience standing in a room and talking to someone, um, and, and they're by no means the same. There are important differences to them. But until you uh, can actually compare those two things, I think, I think that's what gives you uh, a much deeper perspective into how these things can be used as tools of things like interdependence and, and you know, bringing societies closer together. Because there are, as Josh mentioned in uh, Second Life, all of these different, um, you know, uh, all, people from all of these different nations running around and bumping into each other and people, users have written tools for translating from one language to another and it's, it's very interesting to see this happen and to see this, to see a kind of uh, global culture take shape, albeit on a, a very, very small scale, um, but it's interesting to see, to see that work and to, to think about how that can be leveraged for, uh, you know, uh, in a directed way to support things like interdependence. So, you know, if I have a message uh, today is to urge you to, uh, you know, to sign up for Second Life, which is free, and, and just to check it out. So, thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, let's see, my mic, I think, needs to be... It's green, but I'm not. Um, so, the, uh, I'll wait because uh, we need for our Second Life audience to hear us. You got me? Ready? What's that? What's that? Um, let's have them go first, just in the interest of time, see if we can get that going. Unless you feel like you have some stuff you want, you want to, you want to start, talk first? Okay, so um, just to uh, echo a couple things that Mark, that Mark mentioned, there was a, a, sur a Stanford University survey conducted about three years ago that asked uh, people who were participants in these virtual worlds, um, how many of them consider themselves to actually be physical residents of the virtual worlds. The survey came back that 42% of the people actually considered that they were residents. That is, they, we have our homes, our apartments, what have you, but they also considered that, that a part of themselves belongs in this space. We, in, this is this term, there's a term we've, be, we've evolved for that, or that's been evolved for that, we've call, that we're calling co-presence, which is a sense of not only do I feel like I'm here, but when I'm in that virtual world, because it's a 3D representation of myself, I actually feel that it's an extension of me. Just an anecdotal example. At, as I'm walking my avatar around, and I'm not terribly great at managing these sorts of things, if I were to bump into your avatar and not say, excuse me, um, one of the common responses you'd get from someone in Second Life is, well, shouldn't you say, excuse me? Well, that may not seem very, may not seem odd to those of you, unless you imagine that it's, unless you consider the fact that it's really just a bunch of pixels on a, pa on a screen that are bumping into each other, and why in the world should someone be concerned that I didn't say, excuse me? They should be concerned because they feel like they're physically there, and it's that extension. And just to, one last thing before Ben uh, uh, steps up, and I think this is a good lead into him, just to illustrate how this is entered into popular culture in the United States, uh, on, in this Sunday's Doonesbury, uh, there's actually a, a strip about Second Life in which the dad, who's a journalist, comes in and asks his son, uh, what, did, what did he do today? Basically, another day of doing nothing online. The son says, Dad, I spent the morning in my office at my private foundation on Second Life, where my avatar raised nearly $600 which I then took to donors to choose.org to buy next textbooks for a class I adopted. Then I spent the rest of the afternoon chatting with kids about the upcoming school year. What did you do today? Um, uh, I wrote a piece on Fred Thompson's manicurist, but that's not the point. Anyway, Ben Barber is going to come in and offer some responses before we go virtual. 
Thanks so much, uh, Josh. I want to do it because I want to connect this back to our theme, and I think a lot of people might be saying this is very fascinating, but what's it have to do with immigration and interdependence and all the things we're talking about? And I want to make that connection and pose some specific questions for you all and for our friends who are online. I'll preface it by saying I am on Second Life and have been on for a while, and I go on regularly because I'm very curious about these new technologies. And I have a simple message for you all. This new technology, the new virtual reality, is something we who care about the real problems of the world have to understand and figure out what it's about and whether or not it has anything to do with finding solutions. My own view is that the architecture of this new technology is promising. It's horizontal, not vertical. It allows people to talk to one another. It crosses borders and frontiers. It is a sign of interdependence that there are millions of people in places where the countries they come from don't matter, who gather together and do all the kinds of things that you all are talking about. So it's a very promising medium in its architecture and background, and one that a lot of people working in the real world on the tough real problems don't know very much about and tend to think, well, that's just some game up there. And so we, we, need, we need to listen carefully and learn more. And that's, that was the message you all had for us, and that's great. But, but, and now I want to put this to you and our friends in Second Life. The architecture is one thing. The actual use in reality is another. The architecture is one thing. The ownership and the aims of the ownership is another thing. What we have seen today, forgive me, is an exercise in triviality, fashion, and commerce. And uh, you in particular talked about virtual Laguna Beach, spring break, prom room. We were talking about you know kids starving to death and having their organs removed and sold in the other world. And, you know, we get a picture of these things. At the end, Josh, you yourself did say there are a few people who have raised a little money. There's no question that some tiny percentage of this new world of technology is being used by goodwill people, including people at the MacArthur Foundation who actually have done fundraising and tried to spend money there in philanthropic ways. But the reality is 99% of those who are on Second Life, who play World of Warcraft, who go on these new social networks, couldn't care less about any of the things that are being talked about here. Don't know about it, don't talk about it, don't care about it. The fact they have computers to start with means that are a level economically where they're part of the haves. And the reality is that an extraordinarily promising technology is being squandered on entertainment of the most trivial time kind, often replicating what wasn't said here is the most popular sites on Second Life or pornographic sites, sites where you buy things, sites where you can have free sex. You should also know this, it might interest you, you can buy sex organs on Second Life and utilize them to engage in virtual sex. Maybe, you know, that's something that folks who don't get enough at home could, you know, <laughs> enjoy. Uh, and that's great, I'm not a prude, I think that's just fine. But we also need to be talking about the realities of what goes on there. I have been on Second Life and tried to start political conversations with people. And I've gone to some of the beaches and the party places where you can buy drinks and said, you know, let's, let's talk a little about politics. And people look at me, you know, like the, the, there is, you know, you can do almost anything. You see some of the way some people appear here. You see this guy over on the left. It's okay to come looking like a flying octopus. But if you say, let's talk about, I was talking with an Australian about your prime minister and my president, you know, they look at you like you're out of your mind. So the, the idea that this is currently available as a civic tool, a political tool, or a cultural tool is just absurd and is a kind of salesmanship done by people who are in it primarily to make money. Let me just close by reading you, let me close by reading you what was in the New York Times the day I left New York, it, even in the virtual world, stuff matters, a great big piece uh, in the second section. The Times comments, Second Life residents find ways to make money so they can spend it to do things, look impressive, and get more stuff, even if it's made only of pixels. And then a champion of Second Life says, Second Life is about getting the better clothes and the bigger build and the reputation as a better builder until we who use technology find ways to put it to the uses 
of a genuine social justice and interdependence, the things we were talking about this morning, it's not just going to squander technology, but it's going to become a distraction to young people from really solving the problems we face. That's my challenge to you all. So, well, actually, actually, let me stick in. Let me. Sure. Sure. You know, I think Dr. Barber is guilty, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, of academic arrogance, which is his critiques, frankly, could be applied to any form of entertainment and any form of technology. I was, the, uh, I was part of the group, the original group of four people who wrote QuickTime for Apple Computer, which is the basis for much of digital video on the planet. And of course, people use it for all sorts of things. They use it for CBS News. They use it for, you know, uh, communications and video between governments. They also use it for pornography. Now, you can say, well, it's a terrible technology. Somebody uses it for something salacious or terrible. But the fact of the matter is, is that the technology exists and people use it for anything that they're going to use it for. And the same thing with entertainment. Now, Dr. Barber may critique MTV's, uh, or anybody else for that matter, Second Life, uh, providing entertainment around clothing, automobiles, music, video, teenage stuff, and say that it's a tremendous waste of time. Absolutely right. No question about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that the reason why people are attracted to it is because for some reason, they're interested in it. MTV didn't create the world of clothing, and it certainly didn't create the world of music, nor did any entertainment company out there do this. Now, they may have participated in the slow denouement destruction of culture as we know it, but it's reflective of our society, and you know, frankly, it's, all, it's up to all of you to want and to spend money on things that you want to see and to ask companies to produce that content for you. Um, now, the other thing that Dr. Barber is also guilty of is, is that he's guilty of using appearance as a judge of character, which is, you know, the ultimate issue here, and I'm, I'm going to address your issue of, of people of color, which is that, again, if you choose an avatar, which is a graphical representation of yourself, it's completely whatever you decide to choose. Um, now, I can't speak for, for Joshua and his avatar, with the blue-green dreadlocks and all that. That's perhaps not the character that I might have chosen. But for whatever purpose, Joshua, who's a professor at USC, decided that that was the character that he wanted to have. Um, I assume it was at your choice, or perhaps... I, I created it. No, it's a self-expression. Self I love it. And somebody had some fun with it. I went into virtual Laguna Beach during the original public testing, and I created an avatar that weighed, oh, a good 150 kilos, call it 320 pounds. And uh, the amount of abuse that I took from other uh, nubile, scantily clad, uh, predominantly female avatars was pretty impressive. I actually didn't realize that it was socially appropriate in any circumstances, digitally or anywhere else, to go around calling people the names that I got called because my avatar was well, had a bit of a paunch. The other thing is, is that on the internet, you know, on, on these virtual worlds, um, the rules change. For example, I don't know what the, what the percentage of American population, which is African American, but I think it's like seven or eight percent, give or take. Ten percent, perhaps. So, in Second Life and also on the MTV virtual worlds, the percentage of African Americans is closer to 30%. For some reason, in virtual worlds, you know, at least in our virtual worlds, where people get to choose their skin color, the number of people who choose a darker skin color is higher than what we found, you know, than what I understand to exist in the real world. Now, I don't know why. I assume it's because of attraction, because it's, you know, a lot of these virtual worlds are music-based. 
I don't know. I just know that at some point, you know, people divorce themselves from the physical reality that we're all living in today. So. Absolutely. Sure. Could be. No I'm question not, about well, it. But, the but, Dean of the Annenberg School is actually African American. Uh, Ernie Wilson. But, uh, uh, but, uh, right. But, but, the, but remember that the first step that people do when they go into a virtual world or a video game these days is to choose the character and to create the character that they're going to use to represent themselves. So I did a, uh, I, I did a game called uh, Knockout Kings, a boxing game for Electronic Arts years ago. And you could choose any one of 14 different boxers you know, from Muhammad Ali to Oscar De La Hoya to whatever, and then you could modify them, you know, based upon their age. You can make them, you know, uh, older, younger, uh, taller, wider, smaller, whatever you wanted to do. You know, the, and now with these virtual worlds, you know, the possibilities, are, I wouldn't quite say that they're infinite, but certainly a lot of the technical work that's being done is around how do people want to represent themselves? And the, people mutate. People mutate based upon gender, they mutate based upon their age, their height, their weight, their facial characteristics. You know, my avatars have a tattoo. I don't have a tattoo. My avatars don't have gray hair. I have gray hair. Yes, sir. We live with a filmmaker, a 28-year-old filmmaker. So I'm right. watching this new technology on laptop editing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm involved with young designers uh, all the time, uh, writers. And it is amazing what your generation has brought. But the issue of ethics on life-defining issues, such that when you do presentations, entertainment is good, diversion is good, but we've got to calibrate so to bring a presentation in which it is all about individual capacity to in reinvent oneself in the face of all of the things that you are aware of, looking at your own industry, and, and, and I can almost describe what your industry looks like, notwithstanding the fact that the head of the Annenberg may be an African American. Uh, mm -hmm. That says a lot about history, but very little about our future, uh, just to be able to say, one, because skin color doesn't think. So when you think about these presentations, the word of ethics, not just the phenomenal dimensions well, let me, of, of what you're involved in, is what I would ask you to consider and I would all, all of us to, to consider. Thank you. So the, the graduate program which I teach, which is the Stark program for producers at USC Film School, and I've taught now for six years. We had a faculty lunch the other day and one of the interesting things is that of the 24 incoming graduate students working on their MFA, more than half are female, which is the first in the program. Um, and the second thing is, is that I probably am guilty of making a mistake here because I brought a, uh, a video from MTV of you know, pop, music, teenagers, all the rest of it. The other video that I actually considered bringing was a, a promotional piece on a lesbian, gay, bi, virtual world, which was being created by MTV, 
specifically for that population, for people who are already distinct, you know, and chosen to be distinct, or are distinct for whatever reason. And uh, it's a, you know, it's meant to be a virtual world which is essentially much more modernist, minimalist, aesthetically interesting and all that, you know, specifically that, but I thought that that video actually might not be the right for this audience. So. Can I, can I add, Peter, to yes, sir. Can I sure. respond to your, uh, to the ethics, uh, uh, the point about ethics is, is that, you know, I don't think it's an either or situation. It's not all good or all bad. It's not all an, uh, a piece of entertainment, nor all a, a political tool, but um, which is, is uh, why I mention uh, sometimes when I talk the, uh, the importance of how these places are governed, right? The technology does exist as a tool and it's, and it's starting to become much more widely available. Um, but it, 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 you know, at the moment these are, these are places that are run by corporations and, and uh, you know, and the corporations set the rules there. Um, but that doesn't stop uh, people like uh, um, Peter Ludlow and myself at the, at the Second Life Herald, one of the reasons that the Herald exists is to agitate for justice in the virtual world. And, and we actually do a lot of that. And it's a, it's a very fascinating thing to watch, the ways in which injustice is perpetrated uh, uh, between user, among users of the virtual world and, and as well um, uh, between the, the, the people who control the world and, and the users. And, uh, and you know, it, it may sound like something trivial that, that you know, we would agitate for, for freedom of speech in these places, right? Um, because what are they? They're just a game. They're, they're, a, they're, a, they're a corporate product that's being sold and people are making money. But you have to remember that, you know, as, as, as colorful as MTV's worlds may look and as, 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 you know, as many dreadlocks as Josh can get on his avatar, that, you know, it's still very early days in this technology and, and, and it's, you know, it will soon become something that's not at all like these, these virtual worlds, these walled gardens, but something that anyone in the audience can kind of throw up a, a virtual space that's their own, just as you can, you can now just start a web page, you know, for, for $10. And, uh, you know, so there is, there's beginning to be some thinking about how these, you know, how this technology in these places will be, will be governed going forward in, in that sense. We're going to do one other question, and then we've got to get to our virtual panelists. But it, it seems to me that's precisely the force of Professor Barber's critique. And I, and I think you probably agree with me, though, Brother Mark. I think the use of the word arrogance is a misfortunate word because it trumps the kind of Socratic energy that we need to manifest in trying to get at what the night side is. That Professor Barber would have said the same thing about radio, television. He would have said the same thing about churches, mosques, synagogues, temples. Any cultural practice has an ambiguous political, ethical, and ideological effect. And he said that in his presentation. All he was saying was that in the presentation itself, we didn't see the level of self-criticism and self-reflection at work. So you could disarm a criticism that could say, there's a lot of triviality, fashion, commerce being enacted in what we saw. It was true. He's just pursuing the truth. So I think when we talk about democracy, when we talk about interdependence, we're talking about an open-ended conversation that's self-critical and self-reflective enough to say, yes, it's a tool that can be used in a variety of different ways, but how is it being used now? In the same way, we just had a wonderful presentation by our, our Catholic brother. He knows the history of Catholicism in terms of its night side, so does the Pope. Domination, bigotry, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and so forth. But he comes forward as our Catholic brother and says, I can be critical about that and acknowledge the progressive prophetic elements of this. Same is true for those who deal in virtual worlds. What is the prophetic in the name? What kind of progressive potential can be realized? That's the kind of openness I think we need to have. And I think you would acknowledge that. And I just wanted to, to put that on the table because anytime we use that kind of language, it, 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 it tends to impose a kind of foreclosure of these, these deeper interrogations in which life and death is at stake for so many of our brothers and sisters on the globe. Well, you're not going to find any disagreement from me. Perhaps, you know, I, I sort of feel like, you know, I walked up on the stage and frankly wasn't prepared to be publicly critiqued about the uses and the misuses of the medium. I can tell you that we've spent, I mean, we, meaning 
you know, all the people that I've worked with have spent so many years worrying about the dark side. And, you know, there's a lot of legislation, but also, frankly, there's a lot of opportunity for people to misuse this stuff. And, you know, we can't avoid our responsibility, but here, I'll give you a trivial example. We wanted to keep people from being able to pass telephone numbers back and forth using our virtual worlds. And the reason why we wanted to do it was because we wanted to avoid, uh, you know, obvious things. People who are underage, for example, who were not supposed to be in our virtual world to begin with, you know, from being contacted inappropriately. And it turns out that humans are infinitely creative in how they will pass a telephone number. The computer software will, you know, delete seven, eight, ten digit numbers. Um, however, there's almost nothing to keep somebody from jumping up and down in Morse code, passing a telephone number back and forth. And there's no way for us to recognize it. But I agree, there's very much of a potential dark side. And uh, it's true with all these technologies. And just one other thing, which is that right now we're in a world where corporations are creating these. They're the making the investments. And I would ask you that you know, corporations are certainly not perfect. And I'm not here to represent uh, corporations as being uh, you know, forces of nothing but good. But I'm not sure who could create these right now. I don't think we want the U.S. government or, or perhaps the Republicans creating our virtual worlds in which we live. So. Okay, so in uh, five minutes or less, we're going to try and get to our panelists uh, virtually. I think we may only be able to get to one of them. I should... What's that? Take ten. Okay. No more questions until we get to the end. We've got we to gotta, we gotta go. We have three people who actually, unfortunately, because they're physically not here, are actually being denied an, opp denied an opportunity to participate. So I want to I uh, try and defend them in that regard. And I should, just as a footnote on the, the questions that have been raised, these are actually the exact kind of questions of ethics, social good, and public good. This is why the MacArthur Foundation is funding this panel and, and the conversation over the years, because all of the, the, these night side issues that you presented are, are, the pop, are the most popular topics that are covered by the media today, and, and no one is examining what opportunity for ethics and social good. So our, uh, a year ago, I was in Rio de Janeiro, and I had opportunity to meet the chief blogger for the Brazilian Ministry of Culture, José Murilo Jr., who actually works for the Brazilian Minister of Culture. I don't know, many of you may have, know, may have heard of him, uh, a gentleman by the name of Gilberto Gil. So Jose is going to say a couple of words and then introduce a uh, video. And I just want to say one note before Jose does this, which is that uh, Gilberto Gil actually has an online diary that he keeps on YouTube. And in that diary, he was talking about, he was reflecting on Second Life. And he said, you know, of course, it's all in Portuguese. So for those of you who speak Portuguese, I invite you to watch it. He said, you know, uh, I'm going to create an avatar on, on Second Life, and it's going to be Chinese, because I want to look Chinese. I don't know what that meant in the broader scheme of things, but I thought it was interesting as far as a creative expression. So, uh, Jose Murillo, I'm going to hand this over to you, and then we're going to run the video clip. Okay. Hello, Josh. Hello, Jose's actually in Sao Paulo. He was actually trapped because of the visa. Go ahead, Jose. You're on. Okay. Oh. Uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity of being here, especially because of the different meanings of the word here within this particular panel. I would like to thank Mr. Joshua Fox from the University of Southern California, who is our moderator here and also, who also has been calling our attention at the Ministry of Culture in Brazil to the many possibilities of the virtual world. I would like also to thank Mr. Benjamin Barber for the creation of this event the Interdependence Day, and for the invitation to come to Mexico and join you in this discussion. As some of you, as some of you may know, I've gone through some problems that prevented me from being among you physically. But then, what a great opportunity to explore how virtual worlds can help us to be together, even when the limitations of the real world keep, us, keep holding us apart. I see my main role here as providing a context for the message of Mr. Gilberto Gil, the Minister of Culture of Brazil, and also to bring some developing world perspectives on this revolution brought about by digital possibilities. Mr. Gilberto Gil has worked hard to build a program for digital culture, which seeks to stimulate projects that make use of open source digital technologies, especially for the local development of cultural groups and communities. 
This experience began to take place about four years ago from the efforts of many people and activists. It basically consists of technical experimentation made available to the population of several regions of Brazil through the effective adoption of open source digital multimedia production tools by what we call the Pontos de Cultura, or cultural hotspots. It's not a coincidence that the experience at the cultural hotspots was the theme of the very first conversation I had with Joshua Fox about a year ago. He was already trying to connect what we were doing in Brazil with the possibilities of the virtual worlds. Since then, we've maintained an open dialogue exploring scenarios where our shared effort could bring the experience of the virtual worlds closer to the crowds from the cultural hotspots. A whole new class of interests in the informational society it is. We can say that we've achieved great pro progress. In fact, I believe that some important technical and conceptual issues of the virtual worlds, especially ones related with centralized control and open source concepts, are only now being properly addressed. I've been reading and hearing much good news from the sector recently, and it gives me the impression that, the way now, the, that we may now have the conditions to start working together. And it is Gilberto Gil once again who comes to liberate us from our locked-in approaches. As an artist, Gil clearly sees the virtual world's infinite possibilities for personal and private expression and development. But as a minister, as the one responsible for opening these new opportunities to all Brazilians, his mission is to carry forth the principles that will guarantee broad access and local appropriation of these new tools. That we, that's what we're going to hear uh, from Minister Gil at, at the video that we're going to show right, uh, right after. But I would like to tell you, all of you, that Minister Gilberto Gil is at this very hour visiting the small town of Piraí in Rio de Janeiro State. Piraí became one of the seven finalists for the title of Intelligent City, granted by the Intelligent Community Forum. Piraí has by now turned into a national icon for the digital activism related with broadband public infrastructure. The peculiar thing about Piraí, this small town, is that a broad collaborative arrangement started in 2004. The mayor, the state university, the public schools, and the state agency for information technology came up with a very intelligent solution to provide public broadband internet access to the whole city. The project is based on a mix of technologies and institutional arrangements that could hardly be imagined, be imagined in a federal bureaucracy or from a desk of a ministry in Brasilia, Brazil's capital. But it's perfectly adapted to the local circumstances and has provided broadband access to all of its citizens. Our interdependence. This is the message Gilberto key to any project relying on the power of the network. We could even add something to the panel's title, from global to local, as we follow Jill's ability to see things from multiple perspectives. We could also say, and from local to global. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. And now we're going to run the video. Okay. Great. Yes. Como é que o senhor vê o papel desses mundos virtuais é, na promoção do diálogo intercultural e na reconexão da diáspora linguística? De uma, de uma ampliação é, de espaços, para dizer, uma outra camada de uma outra, uma, uma nova nova, é, digamos assim, uma outra camada de conhecimento, de informação, é, de afetividade, 
é, nova com essas possibilidades todas que o próprio Second Life e os, as outras ferramentas é, manipuláveis, utilizáveis pela internet, pode dar. As diásporas são muitas, né? enfim, vão de diásporas propriamente é, físicas, enfim, que estão contidas na, 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 na dimensão propriamente física, de indivíduos, nas, de nações, de, de, de lugares do mundo que tiveram que migrar para outros lugares, mas é também a diáspora cultural, a diáspora linguística, como, como se fala aí, quer dizer, são, são línguas, são... são são visões de mundo, são acervos, conjuntos culturais, acervos culturais, enfim, que migraram, saíram dos seus, dos seus lugares de origem e se espalharam para o mundo. A, reconecta, a reconectabilidade é, uma, uma, é, uma das, é um dos elementos importantes desse novo mundo eletrônico e especialmente de, um, de, uma, de uma nova é, loca, no sentido sânscrito, da palavra, né? Um outro planeta, o Second Life, então pode recompor o mundo das diásporas né? de uma forma muito nova, de uma forma mais evoluída, de uma forma mais avançada, é com outras, outros planos de conexão que o que a vida real ainda não pôde oferecer, que o Second Life pode oferecer, com possibilidades futuras de influenciar a própria vida real. Dizer, Territórios utópicos. Territórios utópicos, utopias novas que podem, lá no futuro, aliás, eu acho que esse é o, é o princípio básico que norteia a exploração de, uma, de um conceito como Second Life, que é lá no futuro fazer com, com, com que o Second Life seja um novo estimulador, um novo instrutor, um novo informador Não, da é própria tem. vida real. Second Life, especificamente, que é essa experiência que a gente conhece, né? Como você vê as possibilidades de utilização dessa plataforma por artistas em geral na divulgação dos seus trabalhos e, por outro lado, por programas governamentais como Cultura Viva, Porto de Cultura? Ah, para, para os artistas, enfim, são indivíduos, são é, iniciativas autônomas próprias, absolutamente livres, fazem o que querem, pensam o que querem, dão a configuração que querem aos seus é, perfis e tal, o Second Life está lá, é uma oportunidade muito boa, os avatares, enfim, os, 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 os duplos dos artistas, enfim, vão, vão utilizar aquele espaço da forma que quiserem, fazendo divulgação é, do seu próprio trabalho musical, das suas alternativas, digamos assim, de abordagem, que talvez não tivessem espaço no mundo real ainda e lá no, no, no mundo virtual do Second Life vão, vão ter espaço aberto, pleno, portanto todas as experiências podem ser feitas. Para o Estado, para as, as iniciativas ligadas ao Estado, ligadas ao, aos governos e etc., o Second Life teria que admitir uma adaptabilidade maior. É preciso que o espaço é, que está sendo institucionalizado é, no Second Life, com a questão do, dos, do, dos, do, dos, dos territórios privados e etc., etc., que, que tudo isso fosse, que tudo isso fosse é, compatibilizado com uma outra territorialidade que possa abrigar os, os, os processos estatais, os processos governamentais, as exigências, as questões, etc. Ou seja, nesse caso, eu acho que é o Second Life que tem que se adaptar. Obviamente. Eu, eu mesmo já tenho, estou começando a trabalhar um um pequeno avatar, um primeiro avatar no Second Life. Estamos dando formato a ele, vendo agora como é que ele vai se mexer. Enfim, acho que é um, um, é um, é um projeto muito interessante, mas que precisa estar aberto às grandes contribuições conceituais que podem vir de todos os lugares. Mas eu desejo a vocês que estão aí reunidos né, para elaborar mais ainda as possibilidades 
Que do Second Life deseja a vocês um belo encontro aí. É no México? É no México. Os mundos, vocês aí, os, os mundos virtuais. Aqui. No México. Aqui no Brasil. Uh, thank you, José, and please extend our thanks to uh, Minister Gil. So we're at the very, we're now over time. How much uh, do we have time for one last, one last panelist? Or do we have to cut it off? Okay, so unfortunately people, uh, so uh, apologies to um, the two remaining panelists in Second Life, uh, uh, Gilson Schwartz at University of Sao Paulo, Universidade de Sao Paulo, and, and uh, Francois Barr at the University of Southern California. One of the key things that Jusson uh, was going to be speaking about, which I think was relevant to some of the questions that came out in the middle, is that Jusson is actually working on uh, social activism in virtual spaces and is actually working on trying to facilitate uh, agrarian reform via Second Life. Um, I had the uh, pleasure of speaking on a panel of his in Second Life last week, which was similarly truncated due to te technology. And Jusson, my apologies to you. Uh, Sure. We'll get a recorded uh, video. We'll also put it up. We'll, do, we'll see if we can get Gilson to record a message for us that you could also watch on the Center on Public Diplomacy website for those of you who don't have Second Life accounts, uh, which is at uscpublicdiplomacy.com. So, desculpa me, uh, meu amigo Gilson. Obrigado para, para, para José and uh, apologies, Francois. And I have to say, I think this p panel was a tremendous success because given the, the uh, intense interest and discussion and dialogue, Thanks to Ben for let, indulging me with my hair on fire uh, for, this, for this panel, and thanks to all of you for, for engaging and participating, and I hope that we can continue the conversation afterwards at lunch and, and dinner. And let's go eat. <laughs>